One of the most important messages from research is that special guardianship is giving children the chance to grow up in safe and stable homes following care proceedings, mostly with relatives. These children are very unlikely to either go back into the care system or to experience further care proceedings. This is very important in its own right. It's also very important because special guardianship has become the fastest growing route out of the care system following care proceedings in recent years. When children are unable to find homes with special guardians, they may either be adopted and some of them will go into foster care. We know from international research that foster care is a less stable option than special guardianship and kinship care. We also know that it's costly. On average, it's around 35,000 a year. We need to also remember that at the moment, there are huge pressures on the public purse and there have been mounting pressures, particularly on local authority budgets. So from this we can draw one really clear and simple conclusion. And that is that special guardianship is benefiting children, benefiting families and producing savings to the public purse. Put that together, it's a no-brainer we should be investing in special guardianship. Family is the most undervalued resource of the 21st century. All of the research will, will tell us that where we can keep children within the family, even where the connection between the adult and the child may have been, been uh, uh, not very great initially, that actually the research tells us children do better. They have a sense of identity and a sense of place. If you look back at the Children Act 1989, yeah, family, is, is right at the heart of the concept of the, of the Act. But I think what's happened is that because it's been seen that it's been a family arrangement, the assumption has been there's not so much assessment required or as much support, something where less resource yeah, has, been, has needed to be put in. So rather embarrassingly, when I arrived in, in Leeds back in 2010, our kinship support team, our kinship care team, was literally Bev, yeah, and Bev had a caseload of 220. The definition of it is also um, a challenging one because essentially an order, uh, that special guardianship order, uh, allows you to exercise parental responsibility to the exclusion of all others. I don't know that that's a wildly um, um, insightful term, although it's accurate. There is a, a big issue for the special guardianship sector, whether it's the courts, whether it's local authorities or other people, to familiarise themselves with the nature of special guardianship and to recognise that these are the full-time carers of this child um, until they're 18, and although legally that disappears at 18, that probably it's also a lifelong commitment um, as well. Well, there's been a tremendous transformation I mean, when the special guardianship was first introduced about 15 years ago, uh, the idea, the thought was that it would be something in the private law context where for some reason parents couldn't cope um, and probably limited to particular kinds of family. There's been a complete transformation. Nowadays, much of the emphasis maybe even most of the emphasis, is on the use of special guardianship in the context of care proceedings, public law proceedings, starting from a position where special guardianship was hardly thought of at all in that context. Um, it is now, as it were, the first port of call. If you have a situation where, for whatever reason, uh, the parents are not available to look after the children, then the first thought is to see whether there are family carers, people in the wider family, who might be able to look after them, and if the answer is that there are, uh, then the expectation, the assumption tends to be that they'll be made special guardians. In our last survey in 2019, over half of the kinship carers said that they became kinship carers in a crisis situation with absolutely no warning. 
But what doesn't happen at that stage is they don't get really clear information and advice. So that means they're disadvantaged because they don't understand the system that they're about to enter into. They are not able to appraise their options and make really informed decisions. The thing to recognise again, what makes kinship care different from things like adoption and fostering is people haven't had time to think about this. So what's happening to them is their life. It's like, you know, kinship care said to me, it's like a juggernaut hits you. The life you had before has gone. You've got a new life now as a kinship carer. T to some degree, it's almost un unimaginable for families to think of themselves caught up in this major family crisis where the future uh, care of the children within those families is something that the local authority and the courts are actually making decisions about. It's horrendous to think about. At the same time, children must be protected and properly safeguarded in the way that we have a duty and responsibility to all children. The Public Law Working Group made a number of recommendations in relation to special guardianships. And the headlines are that the assessment of a proposed special guardian must be thorough and comprehensive, and it, the court must allow the local authority to take the time that it needs to complete the report appropriately. The child should have the opportunity of a lived experience with the special guardian before the special guardianship order is made, where they don't already have a pre-existing close relationship. It's vitally important that the special guardianship support plan, which sets out what the local authority will do for the proposed special guardian of the child in terms of support, advice and help, is again thorough and comprehensive and sets out in detail what support will be provided. And it's important that that support plan is based on the lived experience of the child and the lived experience of the special guardian. What research has shown, and anecdotally, is it is supremely important that consideration is given to contact that will take place uh, between the child and their parents, because it's shown that this is a particularly difficult issue for special guardians. And many feel that after the special guardianship order has been made, that they are effectively abandoned by the local authority and left to their own devices. So we make clear recommendations that this is an issue that must be addressed and it must be clear who's going to organise it, who's going to support it and who's going to supervise it. There's a significant development issue for children's social workers, um, which is understanding better what it means to be a special guardian. It's a very... Uh, difficult and unusual arrangement because often special guardians end up in a position whereby quite often they're looking after their children's children. That creates a kind of very kind of particular set of circumstances, a very difficult dynamic for the special guardians to understand and navigate. I think it's really important that we help children's social workers to understand a little bit more about what that really means. So one of the things that that kinship carers experience in relation to children's services fear. Uh, they, f they fear showing that they aren't able to cope because that, that could be interpreted as a weakness um, and a reason to take the children away. There is a very real fear amongst uh, grandparents particularly that if they don't take this baby, that baby will be taken and adopted and they will never see their ba that baby again. And, and what that means is that people often won't ask for the support that they need. What came across from the research was that, that they really did not understand what was going on. And when we asked them about their experience of the assessment, they said that they were being asked all sorts of intimate questions, that really they didn't know why they were being asked those questions and what were the repercussions for them in answering them. And they felt rushed and they felt that they didn't understand the whole process. This is where the best practice guidance is going to be very helpful. There's also been research that we have drawn together highlighting risks and protective factors. So social workers will now have at hand based on a compilation of the available body of evidence which for special guardianship is modest, but is substantiated by the research on kinship care, 
to help them understand which children are more or less at risk, which prospective special guardians might themselves be more or less at risk. And this, I think, will be very useful also for the courts. We did some new research involving focus groups with the range of professionals in light of the leading Court of Appeal case, VPS. And we asked them for their views as to what were obstacles to making the process and the procedures in special guardianship work more smoothly. And one of the things that they highlighted was that there was a resource issue in local authorities, but as well as that resource issue, there is an ethos, a cultural ethos, that says, well, actually, because this is family, you don't need to do such a detailed assessment as, for example, would be required for assessments for foster carers and adopters. So although adoption and special guardianship are two available forms of permanence um, and special guardianship came into force in 2005 and adoption was considerably reformed in uh, 2005, these are very, very different pathways, both with their own advantages, um, but also their own challenges. Um, so I think it's, it's really important for the sector as a whole, whether that's local authorities, the health, the courts, to recognise that um, these pathways to permanence for these two different orders uh, place very, very different demands, very different expectations. People come from very different places. Though the primary issue is still to uh, make sure that this child has a permanent home for the rest of their childhood and beyond, uh, those differences are stark and they really do need to be recognised in the way that we actually deliver high quality, um, appropriate, uh, respectful um, services. One of the things I'm conscious about is not every authority has adapted their processes of assessment and support to meet the needs of special guardians. And therefore what we very often do as a consequence is push them into the processes that we have. Yeah, so rather than having an easy way of accessing support, of having a team that supports special guardians and will respond yet yeah, when needs arise, we push them into the child in need process yeah, or the looked after children process because that's the nearest one to the one that we've got. And I think there is something about recognising the particular challenges of being a special guardian and the needs of children who are being cared for as special guardian and setting up appropriate arrangements for that in the same way as we've done around children who are adopted yeah, and children who are in foster care. One of the things that happens in um, kinship care that makes it different from fostering and adoption is that there is very little preparation training as well. So in our surveys at Grandparents Plus, 95% kinship carers say they have no preparation training whatsoever. And this is one of the areas where local authorities could make improvements happen. If you run preparation workshops, which we do with many local authorities, not only are you bringing kinship care, potential kinship carers together, so they're able to understand the role, they're able to understand issues like attachment, looking after children who've experienced trauma, uh, managing how they will manage contact, beginning to understand those things, which make being a kinship carer different from being a parent, but they also uh, build really strong networks with others who are becoming kinship carers, which will endure, and you shift the relationship between the carers and the local authority because you are creating a supportive environment. And what, the, what that means longer term is that if carers need support, they are more likely to come and ask for that earlier. That means that placements will be, in all likelihood, more stable because they, carers are just, they're getting support when they need it, not waiting for a real crisis to emerge when they fear they can't cope any longer. Now, very properly, we have an approach that care cases should be dealt with, finished within 26 weeks, and that is right for the vast majority of children. 
The problems arise, of course, if, for example, and this is not at all infrequent, the need for special guardianship, the need for kinship care, is something which really only emerges, let us say, around about week 15, week 16, or even week 20. And there one has, um, as a consequence, uh, a great incentive, wrongly in my view, to speed things up and force the remaining parts of the process into the remaining six, eight or ten weeks. And that is wholly wrong. Um, and it's quite clear in my view, it has for some time be, uh, that cases, despite the 26 week rule, must take as long as they need to take in the interest of the children. So the truth for many special guardians is they are locked out of the system. So physically locked out of the system, they are not in the rooms where decisions are made about them and their life. Uh, and they're also locked out by language. So legal jargon, uh, the culture of courts. Most kinship carers have never set foot in a court before and they need support as they do that. I wouldn't want to make a special guardianship order just like I wouldn't be able to make an adoption of them, but actually having the prospective carers in front of me so that they can see me, I can see them, and if need be, they can be asked questions, they can explain themselves, and so on and so forth. And one of the problems is that uh, special guardians are not required as a matter of necessity to be parties. Uh, there is a, a lack of legal aid for them, and therefore, uh, even whether or not their parties are often not represented. So the other aspect which needs to change is it needs to become established, in my view, that the special guardians, the prospective special guardians, prospective kinship carers, are always before the court, part of the process, uh, that they are represented if they wish to be, as often they will be, and that they're properly funded by way of legal aid for that purpose. The Public Law Working Group has made strong recommendations that proposed special guardians should be kept informed on a regular basis of what is happening in the court process, what is happening with their assessment, and that they have the opportunity to uh, contest the assessment if it's negative against them and they think it's wrong. Uh, we also recommend that in appropriate cases, uh, proposed special guardians should be made a party to the proceedings so that they have a clear voice in the proceedings as well as knowing precisely what's going on. So they're completely informed about the background of the parents, they're completely informed about the needs of the child and they know precisely what it is that they're going to face uh, when they take on the care of the child. We found from listening to the special guardians in the focus groups was very often negative. And the reason for that was principally because they had had so little legal advice prior to the proceedings. They had no idea what to expect. They didn't really understand often even what special guardianship is and what the implications are. And we were shocked to hear that they were having to Google it, literally, to find out what a special guardianship order is. Local authorities vary considerably in the amount they pay for legal information and guidance. On average, it's something like two hours of advice, uh, which works out around 250 pounds for something that's going to change people's lives, the child life, their own life, the birth parents' lives, forever. For most people, the idea of going to court is horrendous. There are issues for the courts, there are issues for the way that the courts actually operate, but there are also issues for the system as a whole um, in being respectful, uh, being supportive and being thoughtful um, about just what it must feel like to be a family member who on the one hand is saying, yes, I will take this responsibility on, but actually feeling marginalised and not listened to when it actually comes to that process of making that uh, life-changing decision. The, the issue of contact that you, you raise, because of the volatility of relationships, can be a really difficult one because you want to encourage contact with, with birth parents, 
but it's important that that is positive both in terms of the, the quality of that contact that the child has uh, with their parent, but also positive in terms of the messages that the child is hearing about the special guardian. The issue of contact is a difficult one. For some children, fairly regular contact, even when they're placed with their special guardian, with their parents, will be in their welfare best interest. In other cases, it will have to be, in the child's interest, less frequent, and in extreme cases, no contact at all. Uh, the support plan must set out precisely what contact is going to take place. That will, of course, need to be reviewed over the years as the child grows and needs change. Uh, but it's important that it sets out what support the local authority is going to give and that the special guardians are clear about what their role is in organising contact and how often it's going to take place. The evidence from the research is that contact can be very damaging. So as much as I talk about the strengths of kinship care being related to family relationships, in our research, around half of young people who grew up in kinship care said that contact with their parents was difficult and they needed more support with that. So we have to acknowledge that and make sure that we put in the support for the children, for the carers and for their parents. How the family then get, reacts to local authorities saying your son or daughter is not, not suitable to care for these children. Um, so the maternal side, well I'll put my hand up and I'll say I could do this. What are the paternal side of the family going to think about that? You know, we always knew that, uh, um, that you didn't like our daughter. So does it then kind of escalate into um, a series of accusations, of blame, of hostility? Can there really be an, ex uh, an expectation that the paternal and maternal side of the family come together? That's one of the challenges. It's a primary duty and responsibility of local authorities and others um, to be open to those issues, to try to offer support when it comes to those issues and that may include um, offering supportive therapeutic services to see whether those family relationships at least can be brought down to a more livable level. Contact in special guardianship is probably the most difficult precisely because it's relations within families rather than with strangers in inverted commas, that is prospective adopters or foster carers, where there is that same emotional charge. What this recent research has shown is that it's not the frequency of contact that matters, it's the purpose and the quality. What do you do if your own adult child turns up drunk? Is that contact helpful or is it actually harmful for the child at that point? And who frequently is left making that very difficult decision? It's the special guardian. It's not just the special guardians who need the training and the advice and the support, but both parents should have access to that too because they don't always realise that if they don't turn up, having promised that they will, that that child may for a long time after feel absolutely let down, that behavioural problems and emotional difficulties may flare up again and there's no easy way of saying why that's happened. Children understand if they're forgotten. If a kinship carer uh, takes a child very quickly, they, that child may never enter the care system. So you've done the right thing. You have prevented your, maybe your grandson going into care. But the consequence of that is that you are then not eligible for support. And even if you take out a special guardianship order, whether or not the child was ever in the care system determines the support that you and the child will get. And so the system is riven with inequality, but people don't understand that at the beginning. They're just doing the right thing. They feel once the assessment, 
process is over and they've been approved, and the child is in their care, the door is then closed. I think local authorities have been slow to recognise the particular needs of, of special guardians. I think they're, they're getting a lot better at that now about the importance of having a range of support for special guardians so it's not one size fits all. Not everyone will want to go to a support group. Not everyone will want to access particular training. But it's actually having a range of things around me where I can pick what's right for me. But I can change that and I'm allowed to change that when the needs of the child changes. In terms of what happens at the moment of support that's available to special guardians, it varies enormously across the country. Some local authorities are very good and they do provide the support and the financial payments to assist special guardians, but it's patchy. And that's why the Public Law Working Group uh, strongly advised and made recommendations in relation to the support that is made available to special guardians so we achieve more consistency and uniformity across the board and special guardians do get the support and help that they clearly need. We cannot assume that there's a, um, a straightforward transfer of what you've learnt uh, to returning to, uh, to a young child, whether that's a baby or a toddler or maybe an older child, to thinking about, I'm an expert in parenting because those parenting skills and knowledge have to be adjusted again um, to that particular child in those particular circumstances um, you know, with a well-recognised set of challenges that um, these children have um, very typically had a very, very poor start in life. Support, um, uh, when it comes to special guardianship, is seen to be something quite different um, to that of adoption. Sometimes it feels as though because it's family, family is enough, uh, we don't need kind of special services. I think for special guardians themselves, they will have their own views, which may be quite different to adopters about what they actually need. We know there are often financial issues, there are often um, housing issues, um, the, the issues that I've talked about when it comes to contact. While on the one hand, I would want to say that there are two uh, parallel but equally um, similar processes. Um, the way that uh, those processes have been delivered and uh, developed over time really does indicate that we need to pay much, much more attention both to the nature of special guardianship when it comes to support plans, but we still must follow the um, regulatory framework which actually says if you need support then you must ask. One's tempted to say of course what we need is more resources, more money, but I do think it would be very foolish not to realise the immense value which a proper process in court has in making sure that uh, these problems are identified up front, that the judge before he or she makes the order can get the appropriate assurances from the local authority, if need be calling in the people who control the purse strings, to get them to accept they're going to do this, um, and if appropriate, and it will often be appropriate, writing this into some formal document, a care plan for want of a better expression, which the special guardians which kinship cares can then turn to as the years go by, saying, look, what the judge ordered, what the judge said had to happen, and what you agreed to happen was X, Y, and Z. Why is it not happening? Being a special guardian hits you after the order is made. The, the needs of the children emerge after the order is made. And I think that sort of closed door approach is, is the problem. What, what kinship carers and special guardians need is an open door to support when they need it as the child grows up. Child's needs will change, they need to be able to go back and ask without fear for help. The Adoption Support Fund is called the Adoption Support Fund because that is a decision the government has made. Um, I think it's unfortunate that although it was initially constructed to provide support to adopters, the government made absolutely the right decision uh, to extend the remit um, of the fund to include special guardians. Uh, take up is, uh, among special guardians is still quite a lot less than it is compared with adopters. Um, I think that if the government was to reconsider that uh, decision and change its name, uh, then actually that might help in ensuring there's greater take up. Going forward into the future, the key thing though is to make sure the fund remains in place, is available to special guardians as well as to adoptive families. 
poor housing and deprivation can have lasting effects in adult life. It doesn't necessarily have to and all sorts of factors come into play like support, resilience, there's many other things. It's not inevitable but it is a known risk factor. So we obviously have to ask ourselves why we're putting special guardians in the position of having not as much support as they frequently tell us they need financially. There are various issues, again, which are set out in regulations when it comes to means testing, um, the availability of um, financial support. But I think that a lot of people still find themselves very unclear and very unsure about are they going to have enough um, uh, finance to support becoming a family again, to care for children. And that can be affected by issues like having to give up work, other benefits, um, and it's, it's certainly not unfamiliar to hear that uh, special guardians are using food banks or other f forms of charitable support or making major adjustments to their own lifestyle, struggling to find appropriate uh, bedroom space, children who have been sleeping in the same bed as their special guardians. We also know that the Ombudsman has handed down a series of um, uh, conclusions to inquiries that have been undertaken, again where it deals with these, uh, the inadequate nature of um, financial support. One of the um, issues for the sector as a whole is to recognise that uh, partly because of the place that special guardians are coming from, partly because of the crisis that they find themselves um, emerged in, and partly because of the huge consequences of actually becoming a long-term carer for uh, a family child or family children, and there are just too many um, issues that come up from special guardians themselves about making sure that uh, food, clothes um, and other basic necessities of life are properly catered for. Setting up the practical arrangements in terms of accommodation, in terms of things like buggies, push chairs, high chairs and so on and so forth, is absolutely vital and it costs money money which the grandparents wouldn't otherwise be spending, money which they may, they may not have. If the children were in care, in foster care, uh, the state would be having to fund that and support that. It's very important to me that the state should likewise be doing that um, in the case of kinship care. What one thing we need to do is to recognise that being a special guardian is not the same as being a parent. Kinship carers had not planned this, the children have got quite significant early experiences, so often have experienced trauma, neglect, abuse, which will have long-term consequences for those children. The carers are plunged into poverty by the situation. So in Grandparents Plus surveys, we see about half of kinship carers give up work when they take on the children. At the same time, they're not getting an allowance which fully covers the cost of raising children. So the system is putting them into poverty. There is a huge need to just recognise this and to ensure that we're not taking children from their parents and placing them with special guardians and other kinship carers, putting them into poverty. Uh, the recommendations of the Public Law Working Group fall in relation to special guardianship orders to two parts. One is those for immediate change and those for longer term changes. The longer term changes, for example, providing uh, legal aid funding for prepaid special guardians, uh, will require uh, government additional finance or changes to legislation, and that will plainly take time. The vast majority of the recommendations, however, can be implemented immediately. Uh, and those are essentially that there is a thorough and comprehensive assessment of the proposed special guardian, uh, that the child has a lived experience with the proposed special guardian before uh, the special guardianship order is made, and that the support plan for the child and for the special guardian is detailed and comprehensive and provides exactly what the local authority are going to do to assist this child and this special guardian. The important message is one size does not fit all and the plan must be tailored to the child and to these special guardians.
The board's priorities start with the first stage, which is the assessment and experience of special guardians in the court process. Uh, second priority is to improve the support that's made available to special guardians and children subject to those orders in school and education. Uh, the third priority is to make sure that going forward the Adoption Support Fund to be better tuned to uh, provide what needs to be required for uh, special guardianship families. We have not heard the voice of children living with special guardians. We need to know what their experiences are, what worked well for them, what are their issues, so that we can take that on board in practice. We need more research on what works well in contact, given that it is one of the most challenging and difficult areas. We need to know what proportion of special guardians are not grandparents. Issues around ethnicity, the sizes of sibling groups that they take, all this should be routine information and we need the Adoption Support Fund to be monitored on a regular basis. So there is guidance for family and friends care and special guardianship. The truth is it's not enough. There are too many kinship carers who are not getting the support they need. We need the government to introduce legislation and bring funding to local authorities so they can provide the support that these families need. Without it, these children will not do as well as they, can, they could. We need to stop uh, treating kinship care as the same as fostering an adoption. It, it's like putting a square peg into a round hole, recognise what kinship care is and build a system and support services that work for these families. One of the things kinship carers tell us is that the, the impact of not getting support and having to fight for everything is really detrimental to their own mental and physical health. And what's really worrying is that a third of kinship carers in our survey of over a thousand said that it's so detrimental they are not sure that they will be able to continue as carers. If they cannot continue as carers, if we don't support them to continue, that's a lot of children who are at risk of entering the care system. One hears too often for comfort, uh, kinship care or special guardians making this complaint. They feel they're being taken advantage of by the state. The state has turned to them in a panic. The social workers have turned up on their doorsteps and said, look, can you look after these children? Their instinctive reaction is good family members, uh, as loyal aunts, uncles, grandparents, as say, of course, yes. But then they feel let down. And that is a very serious indictment of the system. I don't criticize the social workers. The problem is they don't have the resources, which they, I'm sure, would like to be able to make available to these families. But it is a very serious problem, and it's getting worse. So I think one can't um, overestimate the importance of a proper process. Not least because a proper process probably saves money down the line. It's a false economy to economise at that stage. But ultimately comes back to this. I mean, are we a decent, caring society? And if the answer to that is yes, then these resources have to be found. Um, if the answer is no, uh, then it is shocking. And if the answer is out of one side of our mouth, yes we are, but the other side of our mouth, by the way, we can't afford it. And that's equally shocking. We as a society haven't yet recognised just how much we owe special guardians and that we really need to be investing in it. I think that we have got to remind ourselves that this is about vulnerable children living in complex circumstances um, and that as a state we have duties and responsibilities and obligations to both those children and to those carers, both in the short and in the longer term. Um, I think that the sector has not been uh, focused and driven enough by those issues and that the turning point comes now, both with the best practice guidance um, and the fact that we have the evidence that suggests um, 
but we need to change um, and it now needs to be changed now.